Welcome to this episode of Grit Rising. Today I have with me Bree Thomas, who I'm really excited to have. Um, we're going to talk about some of my favorite things, health and food and wellness, um, a little bit about her past and how she got to where she is today and uh, and what the future looks like. So with that, I'm going to have you introduce yourself and uh, we'll get into it. Yeah. Hi, guys. My name is Bree Thomas. Um, I'm the owner and head chef of a company called Nutrivenience in Orange County. We're a plant-based meal delivery company. Um, I also teach cycle classes at Moxie Fitness. So yeah, like you said, all things health and wellness and nutrition and making people feel good from the inside and on the outside. You know, I think um, one of the unique things in American culture today is we learn math, English, science, all those things, and we don't learn anything about what we put in our bodies. Very and it's little. always kind of mind-blowing to me, right? You know, the, the two things that I'm passionate about, finance and financial planning, we don't teach anybody about that, mm-hmm. and then two, health and wellness. Like, outside of the PE teacher, you know, with the short shorts on and, and whatever, <laughs> um, those are two topics that are very, very rarely done. And so um, maybe talk a little bit about kind of what got you into health and wellness in, in the first place. For sure. So I actually moved to Orange County. I had my cosmetology license and I did hair. Um, and I worked in the industry for a year, realized that I hated the industry. I'm a super creative person. I love working with my hands, but I just didn't like the industry itself. Um, so I quit. And I started working at restaurants in the meantime, just to make money. And I actually started working at True Food Kitchen right when it opened in Newport Beach. Um, Got super inspired, made really good friends with some of the the people on corporate there. And I had always loved cooking. My parents cooked a lot when I was growing up, but I never really looked at it as a profession or a career um, until I started working there and kind of made the connection um, with health, right? With what food does to our bodies and all that stuff. It's not just recipes to taste good or recipes to to feed your family. It's recipes to nourish yourself, recipes to feel energized, stuff like that. Um, So it kind of lit a little bit of a fire inside of me and really um, increased my interest in culinary arts. So I went to culinary school, Um, funny enough for one semester because I got a job as a private chef which is what I wanted to do. I wasn't interested in working in restaurants. I wanted to help people directly. Um, I didn't just want to chop lettuce all day. Um, So yeah, it was stay in school or work for this family and start to build my resume. And I ended up choosing the latter. And it just kind of built from there. I worked for six years in the private chef, um, I would say sector, and got to a point where I had too many clients. So creating Nutrivenience, starting my company was a way to essentially continue to scale myself. I feel like private chef is pretty wide ranging, right? Mm-hmm. You have the, the private chef that just has food ready, you know, mm-hmm. kids come home and there's chicken tenders ready or whatever, and there's a nice meal at night. And then there's the private chef that you hear about, you know, a LeBron James spending a million dollars on his body a year or mm-hmm. uh, a Tom Brady who's, who's big on the plant-based diet as well. Talk about, um, kind of walk through what made you go towards that plant-based, nutritious, you know, chef? Definitely. So working as a private chef, I actually didn't solely focus on plant-based meals. Um, What made me get to that point was everybody that I started working for, they all wanted to lose weight. That was their one request when I came to, what sort of recipes do you want me to make? Okay, well, I, I want something for weight loss, right? So I experienced a lot of different diets, Um, through my clients and I had to prepare them and watch them obviously see how successful they were with them all of these things and during this process I got incredibly interested in holistic nutrition I started taking online courses and stuff like that Um, and I started implementing a lot of the things that I was learning to my clients because a lot of their reactions to the majority of these quote-unquote diets were they're starving, they don't feel good, they have low energy, they're not working or they're working temporarily and they're bouncing back, right? So I kind of, through years and years, developed this so-called plan, if you will, that was vegan, whole food, plant-based meals. Um, And through this, realized that I could help my clients lose weight while still feeling energized and feeling good without having to eliminate complete food groups, essentially keeping them healthy. It's something that they could sustain forever, right? It's not 
no offense to the ketogenic diet, but like you're not getting fiber, you're just eating high fats and you're, you're missing out on a lot of food groups, which means you're missing out a lot of micro and macronutrients, right? So this was kind of the, the winner of all of the things that I had found um, that worked, made my clients feel good. I could still make the food delicious um, and it's something that they could sustain. So all so often when people go down this path, they get painted like extreme. Mm -hmm. Like if you're vegan, you must only eat vegan. And if somebody sees you pick up like a fish taco, like, oh, you're not vegan at all. You're, you're, you know, all of a sudden you're a liar. You're a phony. Mm -hmm. Um, kind of walk through your thoughts on that versus, you know, for me, I, I eat pretty healthy. I have white red meat. Um, mm -hmm. I eat some chicken, but if I tell somebody, oh, I, you know, I just eat fish and, you know, or pescatarian or whatever, and they see me eating a, a chicken, like, I'm a phony, which is yeah. crazy, right? Yeah. Like so, I mean, I, I've gone through that, right? So I actually am not a vegan. Um, and people get very confused by that statement for all the reasons that you just said. It It is a person-by-person -person basis. For me, I think I'm such a believer, and you have to do what feels best for you and your body. And I don't think that that is a one-size-fits-all, right? Um I think in this day and age, especially with all of the resources that we have, whether it be internet, podcast, education, um, there are so many different avenues that you could take in terms of diet, nutrition. You don't have to necessarily stick yourself into a box. I know that you know, people who are plant-based and label themselves as vegan, there are a wide variety of reasons why they may have chosen that lifestyle, right? Some of it is for the animals, some of it is for um, the planet. Some of it is for health reasons. Um, everybody has different belief systems. So explaining my own, um, I feel the best when I eat that way. However, I'm a foodie and I love food. So I also believe in living a balanced life because I believe that's the only way to sustain it, right? Do you, when you look at diets today versus diets 30 years ago, um, and you look at <laughs> obesity today versus where it was 30 years ago, do you think it's more of, and this is a little bit controversial, but I'm going to ask you anyways, do you think it's more of there's an acceptance towards ob obesity mm -hmm. or the food has fundamentally changed in the last 20, 30 years, or just our portions are so much bigger because literally I was in Greensboro, North Carolina a month ago for a track meet and I'm like hey where should I eat and they're like oh go to that place you get a lot of food for what you pay and I'm like that's how this is being quantified you know like like what would you say is kind of causing what's going on in America today I mean I think it's I think it started with processed foods I think it started with the way that we changed and altered food from this life source to this thing that has infinite shelf life and doesn't necessarily resemble anything that came out of the ground or off of a plant. Um, and then I think from there it grows, right? Food like that that's high in sugar, high in carbohydrates. I mean, people are literally making these designer processed meals or processed foods in labs to make them addictive for us, right? So you crave these meals, therefore our portion size get bigger, therefore we want more of those things, or you eat these salty foods, you crave sugar, everything's just kind of imbalanced. I would say it's the latter. I would say the food itself has changed, and I would say definitely portion size because of that have increased, right? Or just marketing and media. You look at fast food, right? At first it's just a cheeseburger. Now you have, you know, double doubles, Big Macs, you have four by fours, you have all of these things. It's like, everybody just has to be bigger and better. I mean, that's the American way, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's crazy because so much, you know, I'm lean. I've always been an athlete and, um, and I've always at the same time struggled with, I didn't have any idea what to eat in mm -hmm. college. I just ate, you know, top ramen. I was broke, whatever. Um, but more recent, as I got older, I started to learn. Um, and, and here's a perfect example. I go to Croatia a month ago with my kids and I, pizza, I ate gelato, I ate whatever, right? We just in, indulged. Mm -hmm. And um, and two things that I thought were unique. One, I lost five pounds. Um, <laughs> this, the, 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 that's the first unique thing because I'm normally much more like strict in terms of what I eat. But the second thing is Americans react or friends' reactions. They're like, oh, because you were walking around a much. 
And those that really know me know, like, on vacation, there's no way that I could work out as much as I'm working out at home. Mm -hmm. Like, no chance. Yes, me and my kids ran on call or in in, um, Croatia and all that. But, like, there's no way that the little bit more walking I do or, or actually less would do that. And so it's just shocking to me what that did to my system. I come home, I start reading about, okay, wait a minute. I can't eat pizza at home without gaining all this weight. Or, and you start to read about like soft wheat versus hard wheat mm-hmm. and just even the difference. Most people in America don't realize the wheat in America is nothing like the wheat in Italy or Germany or those types Correct. of things. Kind of give me your thoughts on that. I am a firm believer that the way that food is in its original form was created perfectly for us and the farther we stray from what that original blueprint was or is um the more issues that we have right so we start modifying things you know from the beginning i mean genetically modifying right and then they come out of the ground and then we turn them into all of these other things you're taking all these puzzle pieces and you're moving them all around you're taking some of them out and then you're giving them to your body right it's like a it's a code essentially your body can no longer read that code if there's pieces missing or if there's pieces from something else put into it, you know? Um, So I think other countries are a little bit more diligent. Um, I don't know why, (laughs) but I think they're a little bit more diligent in allowing their food to be modified to a certain extent. I feel like in the U.S. um, So you want to know why? Tell me, please tell me why. (laughs) In the U.S., they don't check on something until there's a problem. Mm Mm-hmm. In Europe, they check on something before they release it. Hmm. So, uh, for seems ex- like a simple, you know, crazy, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> but but even if you go no, not f- food, but if I go to the OxyContin and you go to like Empire Pain and, and everything around OxyContin, all of the records that the FDA approved were were s- trials and studies that Purdue Pharma created. For sure. So they were all BS studies or, or manipulated studies to mm-hmm. do that. And, and in America, the FDA is is run and controlled by by the food industry. I'm not being some random conspiracy theorist here, but in, unless there's an issue, they're not going to test it. So they're going to allow us to eat, drink, whatever we want until all of a sudden, now the proof is on the consumer to prove. So like I'm sure you've heard about this red dye issue. It's yep. finally being outlawed after mm-hmm. however many years. The proof is on the consumer. The consumer doesn't have any money. Yeah, You and I aren't going to go run uh, test studies on the difference between wheat and yeah. here and, and versus Europe. So it's it's totally backwards Flipped. in I America. Know. I know. I don't know why. Are people just worse here? I mean, why? You know, I used to always watch these documentaries, and I remember um, my boyfriend at the time would be like, well, those people's kids have to breathe this air and drink this water and eat this food. Like, why would you? I think it was like something about Monsanto, right? Yeah. Like, you know, you're poisoning the food system, you're doing these things, but don't these people have children? Don't these people eat food, you know, in the system as well? Like, don't they care? Well, now I'll take the, you know, the devil's advocate. If I'm a corn farmer in the Midwest, Mm -hmm. um, and I all suddenly have somebody come to me that says, hey, I have a way to kill all the weeds so you don't have to hire all these farmers, Mm -hmm. these workers, and, and it's going to allow the corn to continue to grow, that farmer now all of a sudden is going to have more money than they could have ever had. And there's that that inherent conflict of interest yeah. that happens, which has happened to corn. You know, when, when uh, it, it's crazy when the gluten-free diet started to happen, it, you know, nobody explained that the reason the gluten is such a big deal in the United States is because our wheat is so much higher in gluten than mm-hmm. in in Europe, and it's hard for us to process that you know that protein and that sort of thing. So then, when we everybody goes, where do they go to? They go to a corn based diet, right? Mm-hmm. Because flour is bad. Mm-hmm. And then I know for me, I got even like it was worse when I went to corn because corn. Mm-hmm. corn I think is like the devil. If I uh, for my own body, <laughs> yeah. I know that when I put corn based products in my body, like. It's, I feel the worst. Yeah, it's it's a rat race, you know? You just, it's the hamster wheel. And then yet, here we are, we just we just continue to subsidize, you know, the farmers. Not that the farmers as a whole are bad people. 
And if you're going to vote in politics, you're not going to go against the farmers because that seems like the fabric of America. And yep. how could you go against the farmers from that standpoint? Yep. So, so much of this comes down to like, what do we do? What, yeah. what are we supposed to eat? How are we supposed to find these things out? Yeah. If you're talking to like the person listening here that's like, I do want weight loss. I don't know what to fucking eat. What? Where would you tell them to start? Yeah, I mean, again... I think whole foods are where it's at. So just by definition, a whole food essentially is something in the same form as it came out of the ground or came off the bush or whatever. Um, It only contains one ingredient, right? So I think, I don't think you have to get too fancy with it. I think you have to eliminate things that come in boxes and come in packaging and come in plastic and stick to whole foods, you know, um, foods that only contain one ingredient learn to cook a little bit, you know, it can stay simple. Um, but I think we need to go back to basics because that's what our bodies were meant for. And that's what we thrive on. Yeah. You know, I, I went through this as I started to go down the rabbit hole. Um, and I was like, well, there's all these Italians that come to America and then they build an Italian restaurant or, you know, somebody that building off an ethnic food. Um, why, why is it not the same? And the reality is, Less than we import less than one percent of of our, the the wheat in house. So mm. somebody comes here, they build an Italian restaurant, and they're still making pasta and stuff with the wrong wheat. Mm-hmm. It's so shocking to me that somebody doesn't go. I'm going to come here, and I'm going or a French person. You know, I can go to France and I can eat all the croissants, and wine I want, and be, and be fine. fine. Yep. And, and I love a good chocolate croissant. <laughs> um, but here, if I have, you know, a, a chocolate croissant every day, like I notice it right away. And yep. it's it's so shocking to me that these chefs, these entrepreneurs uh, don't bring in authentic foods from those regions. Other places. But it's so expensive. I'm sure. Because they can't do it in bulk. 1,000%. Yeah. Yeah. And food cost, I mean in the restaurant, any sort of food industry, the margins are so small as it is, right? I mean, you're you're looking small. You're lucky if you're taking home, God, they say any big successful restaurant is around five, six percent, you know, mm-hmm. up to maybe 20 percent if you're if you're lucky. So again, margins matter. A few percentages make a big difference. So it makes it impossible. Yeah. And it's fun. And it's what's unique is you say, the best food is Whole Foods, and Whole Foods is owned by Amazon. <laughs> it's like the greatest marketing thing ever, right? Right. Does that, it, does that mean everything in Whole Foods is, uh, is healthy? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely not. Yeah. Definitely not. It, it's it's pretty insane. Um, and then we talked a little bit about when I walked in, um, how much food is associated with trauma, and 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 you know, I I, I think I told you I met the. Um, owner from The Biggest Loser, and he talked about anytime somebody was open up and vulnerable about trauma in their life, they would go on and win The Biggest Loser, or they'd have huge weight losses versus those that didn't didn't want it. And they had always had some sort of abuse. Mm. which and, and so they they ate for a reason for some sort of abuse. Yeah. And, and that was such a crazy thing that here you have this show that you think is all marketing and that sort of thing. And he talked about how he could get to the core if somebody was vulnerable. Why do you think food is so associated with trauma and like goes on there? I mean, I think obviously every human, I'm a big believer that most human behaviors are learned, right? Through adolescence, through childhood. So, I mean, it could be as simple as, you know, you're growing up with your parents and your mom used to make this this one dish, right? And But most of the time your mom wasn't home, so this was like the one dish that was comforting when your mother was around or, or anything like that. You know, you grabbed a bag of chips because your parents weren't around and they, they didn't, they couldn't afford to make dinner or something like that. You know, um, I think food is something that we, we do every day, right? We're involved with every single day. So I think it can very easily get intertwined with any traumatic experience in your life, whether you're a child or all the way up until you're an adult, you know, it's, it's such a unique thing, though, right? As we society, you know, empowerment and independence and that sort of thing. And yet, um, some of the diet issues are are from you know. I'd come home, my mom became a realtor, and mm-hmm. she was off doing an amazing thing. She's one of my heroes today. But now, all of a sudden, I'm open up like a plastic chicken pot pie with yep. all processed food and putting it in there. And 
versus the traditional, you know, as if I'm sitting in Sicily or something and and the mom is making food all day yeah. and, 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 and those meals. And so it's trying to find a happy medium to both. It doesn't put a huge strain on the family, especially in America today with 1, inflation and all that. And at the same time, feeding our children, feeding ourselves mm-hmm. the right the right food. The right food. I heard a, a quote um, that I always use, in fact, is that abs are made in the kitchen. Mm. Your reaction to that? I believe that 1,000%. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, you can't out sit up a bad diet. You know, at the end of the day, I think obviously your stomach is below your abs. And if you have an excess of fat over your stomach, then those abs are not going to show. They might be beneath it, but... Um, yeah, I think I think it definitely comes down to the kitchen and proper workouts, you know. This episode is brought to you by Entrepreneur Magazine and Entrepreneur.com, the one place to go if you want to start, build, and grow your business. Yeah, I, I mean, I notice it in my own body is if I'm not eating as pure food, I can't outwork out my, my diet. Yeah. Like, no matter what. I, and it seems like the stomach area is the least forgiving, you know? Yeah. <laughs> when I'm not eating clean, I always I, I think of myself, I'm like, the best athlete that's the worst looking in the gym is, is my own oh, label for myself. <laughs> Maybe it's being hypercritical. Yeah, of harsh. Myself, that but, sounds a little harsh. <laughs> but yeah, well, a little bit. Um, talk to me a little bit about your experience at Grit and Moxie, the cycling. It seems mm. like um, classes are like the thing now, um, and the inspiration. Like when I watch you or I watch a, a Kelly um, up on stage with, with that kind of classes. What do you think is driving like that cult-like following? I mean, I think community is huge, right? Um, I think especially after COVID, we've seen a huge bump in group fitness classes. People just, there's so many benefits. Um, first of all, it's just a lot more fun to work out with people or friends. Um, the energy is higher. It's a lot easier to get going and get moving and stay moving when you have high energy around you than it is to just sit in your living room and be like, okay, you know, the motivation or the motivation is a lot higher. Um, yeah, it's just freaking fun. And that's why I started it. Um, I started teaching, gosh, six or seven years ago now. I went to a studio and the owner just asked, hey, you want to teach? <laughs> Gave me a microphone and the rest is history. And I first started it as just a hobby. It was like, well, I'm going to be here working out anyways. Why not teach um, and make a little bit of money? And it's turned into a huge passion, a huge passion. Um, you really see how this stuff can change people's lives. Yeah, you end up becoming like group therapist. Definitely. It's their happy place. You know what I mean? It's kind of that one part of the day that you can go and you can shut everything else out and you can just be. Do you think there's a part of it, because when you watch the biggest Peloton instructors or Mm -hmm. Moxie or Grid instructors, um, they're the ones that are saying funny things you know like a, I think of Cody I think is the, the one that the girls listen to here and he's always saying something funny yeah, right something but it's ridiculous it, it's almost like um, it's a place where people can go they don't have to be as vulnerable with mm-hmm. their own feelings like calling up a therapist and saying I want to go sit for an hour and spend a bunch of money versus saying I'm going to come in and I'm going to have some therapy by somebody telling me something that resonates definitely do you think there's something to that Yeah, 1000%. I think, I also think that, I mean, I always call it a form of meditation because when you're in that room, there's so much going on. You, you can't think of anything else. You know what I mean? You're just holding on to the handlebars. You're moving with everybody. Yes. You're thinking about what the instructor is telling you to do, but cognitively your brain is kind of just clear, right? Rather than throughout the day, we're kind of on this Again, hamster wheel, our brain's going through all of these different things. So whether people are conscious of that or not, I think you feel it afterwards. You know, your body's tired, but mentally you're kind of refreshed. You know, one topic we talked about in the last episode was this whole we're from home. And it's and I, as I explore, you know, being a CEO, the idea of so many people that want to work from home. But then at the same time, you have group fitness classes 
CrossFit, you know, which are group classes, um, just exploding. I'm a runner now. I'm back to being a runner. I hate running alone. Yeah. Like I, <laughs> I call up my neighbor the other day. And I'm like, Quinn, please just come run with me. I need, I need to like, I need somebody to run with. Um, a guy lap, you know, paced me on the track today. Um, do you think the work from home and group classes, like there's going to be like, what do you think is going to win out here? I don't, I, I understand. I think people are starting to feel the negative kickbacks from working from home now because they've been doing it for so long. You hear a lot of people say, you know, it's it's hard to stay on schedule. It's hard to stay as motivated, all this stuff. Um, again, I, I haven't done it yet, so I can't really speak to those people. I think group fitness classes will be around forever and ever and ever. I don't necessarily see any negative coming from them yeah um yeah okay i'm gonna shift gears for a second to your company <laughs> um you're female entrepreneur mm-hmm. passionate about neutrovenience um what made you go from the chef to the company and then talk about like the first couple of years and, and what i mean by that is i hear so often this like the new buzzword is um like the, the work-life balance, right? Mm-hmm. And then um, I, I actually saw an interview of yours that talked about the hustle and the grind. Mm-hmm. And, and I, somebody that particularly likes the hustle and the grind, mm-hmm. um, I think it's a little overplayed on the work-life balance thing versus the grind. Like walk through like starting your own business. I feel like so many say, oh, I want, and I coined this, or not, I didn't coin it, but the entrepreneur says, I want to, I yeah. want to do that, and I'm gonna I'm gonna buy a Tony Robbins tape, and I'm gonna watch it, and then I'm just gonna instantly become a millionaire, right? <laughs> um, versus the reality of what it takes yeah. to chase your p- passion, which is awesome that you're doing that, and then what it takes to get it off the ground to where you're profitable and can do it, and the stress is in between. For sure, um, it's a lot. <laughs> so I was a private chef. I started teaching fitness classes and that's when I started getting a lot of people asking for help in terms of food, nutrition, weight loss, stuff like that. So I started helping a couple people at the studio that I was working at making pre-made meals. And next thing I knew I had 20 people and was like, okay, well this is a thing. So I started in my apartment kitchen. Um, and it just sort of evolved from there. I had 20 people to start, which is a lot for one person. Um, and I was still working as a private chef full time. So I did that for about six months. Then I realized I needed a bigger space. I found a friend of a friend who had a bakery who let us use his bakery during their off hours. Um, and I stayed in that kitchen for five, six years. But in the beginning, I did absolutely everything myself. I created the recipes, I sourced the ingredients, I found the packaging that we use, which is not plastic, we use plant-based, I made the juices, Um, I taught myself how to uh, use Photoshop and Illustrator, and I made the labels, Um, I made the food, I cleaned the kitchen, I delivered the food myself, and I did the social media. Like, I did everything while still working full-time as a private chef, and while still teaching fitness classes. That's a lot. (laughs) It was insane, but I was so passionate about it. And I think that obviously everybody's situation is different, but that's what kept me going. This was my baby and I got to build it brick by brick, you know? How long ago was that? Going on eight years. Biggest mistake in those eight years of being an entrepreneur. I wish I would have asked for help sooner. From who? Um, Employees, um, like like bringing on employees, maybe trusting people sooner, um, outsourcing things that I wasn't naturally good at rather than kind of just like biting down and trying to do it myself or even outsourcing things that I didn't necessarily enjoy so that I could focus more of my time on the things that I, the areas that I thrived in. Managing my money. Maybe we can have a conversation after this. <laughs> um, I'd probably say those were the biggest things. Do you think that when entrepreneurs are going through that, some of them is like fear or pride? That's like I don't, I don't 
one hundred percent to even ask for. I think both, and then I think again for me when I'm in it, I was just I mean, going, going, going. There's there was almost no time to think, right? I'm just working out of survival mode. I have. 500 meals that I have to finish, you know, in two days and get out. And it's kind of hard to get yourself out of the mindset of like keeping the ship afloat to figuring out, okay, well, where, what direction are we sailing this ship in, you know? Um, so that took me a few years. Um, but again, as you heard on my probably other podcast, I would have never gotten to where I was at today if I didn't bite down i i was legitimately working 100 hour work weeks yeah for years that's what gives like the real pride in what you've created and what you've done um you know i feel like so many people go okay i'm an aspiring entrepreneur so i'm going to read four hour work week and okay i'm good that's what that that's Mm -hmm. the way i'm going to do this versus um you know for me i same you know in some ways Maybe I'd still be married today if I wasn't a workaholic back then. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, there's been sacrifice along the way. Not Definitely. saying it was perfect, but um, there was something in me that at one point said, you know, like, I need to start eliminating $20 an hour work. And whoever that $20 an hour work, I'm going to hire somebody to do that stuff. And then mm-hmm. I need to start eliminating $40 an hour work, $80 an hour work, so that I was always focused on going up to $100 an hour work, $200, you know, all the way up to, to wherever it takes me. Um, and that's been a, a really good recipe for me is anytime I feel like I'm doing work below, mm. not below me from like a, you know, mm-hmm. a, a, I'm going to go get a T standard, but a below like this isn't the most efficient use of my time standard. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you're starting out and you're grinding, like there's no time to think about that. There's no time. You're just, you're pushing through. And I mean, I don't necessarily think that it should be so glorified, right? Because you do have to make so many sacrifices. I mean, your health, your relationships, so many things during that time. However, for my individual situation and what sounds like your situation as well, um, I do feel like it, it was very, very necessary. I didn't have investors. I didn't have, you know, a business coach. I didn't, I'm an only child. I have no family that lives in the States. Um, you know, I didn't have a lot of resources other than just myself. Yeah, I remember when I grew up, there were like CEOs out there that I really looked up to. And I knew they probably sacrificed a lot, but that was like something I, I looked up to mm-hmm. like a successful CEO. It's crazy to me to see the sentiment now where like people are like, that CEO must be there because they stepped on so many people or, or whatever mm-hmm. it is. Like to me, I take it personally, right? Mm-hmm. You know, not that I'm a Bezos or Musk or anything yep. close to that. Um, but the fact that, hey, like, no, there, there was a... There's some sacrifice here, and and whether you believe that's right or wrong, that's that's what that person did, and that's why they are where they that's are today. That's why they got there. Yeah. Um, but it's it's the same thing with eating, with exercise, with everything. It's there's seems to be such a thirst for mediocrity versus, hey, like going all in. If you want to be better, just mm-hmm. fucking be better. Like step up, step up the food, step up the exercise, step up yeah. the the work method, all those, those things. Um, as you start to see some of the, you know, the the different um, food prep, prep companies, as you start to see the, you know, I'm a vitamin guy, I probably take too many vitamins. Um, I get laughed at, you know, in the morning when I'm taking them. Um, <laughs> What's what, the number of vitamins you take in the morning? I'll tell you what I take. I, I take a multivitamin. <laughs> okay. Easy. It's called like a running multivitamin. I take Nutrafol for my hair because okay. it's like the thing I'm most insecure about. Um, I take a, a fish oil. Okay. I take a vitamin C. Um, and sometimes I have to mix in gummies just because I get sick of taking vitamins. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, I take collagen, mm-hmm. um, both in a pill form, and then I also put it in my coffee. And so That's not too bad. Oh, and I put a, a tart cherry after a hard workout because I want to... Tart cherry is fantastic. Yeah. All right. So Upper. if somebody was just going, I'm going to start being healthier hmm. from a from a vitamin or, or from an eating standpoint, what's like the one vitamin part and then what's the one like nutritional spot that you would give advice on? So I'm not a huge vitamin gal. I definitely believe in supplements. Um, but for one, I'm not a doctor. For two, I think that everybody's body 
is different. Um, I think blood tests are highly beneficial. I think figuring out what your own body's deficiencies are, are great. And then working with a health professional to determine, you know, what sort of vitamin stack you should take is, is huge. Um, with the foods, I'm always, again, I'm going to go back to the whole foods. I think the number one thing you can do is just start to cut out the processed foods. Just start to cut out the processed foods. Um, eating ingredients or eating foods that only contain one ingredient, real food. And whether you, that includes meat, whether it includes fish, whether that includes dairy, whatever you want. But single ingredients. Start reading labels. If you're purchasing things that have labels on them, read the labels. Make sure you can pronounce everything that's in them. You know what I mean? Make sure you know what all that crap is because a lot of it, again, we spoke briefly before we started. It's like people want, I believe that we want to make the right decisions. People believe they're making the right decisions or they hope they're making the right decisions. We're just being deceived. Well, I also think that like, I'm, I'm somebody that really cares. And so I think, okay, I want to go eat an acai bowl because it seems really healthy, right? And then I eat it and all of a sudden I run into a nutritionist or somebody one day. They're like, oh, that's got way too much sugar for you. And I'm like, fuck. Well, what do I do? Yeah. I thought I was going and yeah. eating this healthy thing that yeah. maybe I like, maybe I don't like. I'd rather be, you know, at Chipotle eating tacos than, yeah. than getting the acai bowl. And I think there's so many different the information coming at us. But the one thing that you said that resonated so much is is being able to pronounce something, being able to look at something and go, okay, I, I know all the ingredients in there and that's what makes sense. And then I also think experimenting with your body type. Sans mm-hmm. being able to go get it's some experience you know, expensive, you know, nutritionist or, or doctor, that sort of thing. For me, it was, hey, I'm going to watch what happens when I cut out corn or I'm going to watch what happens mm-hmm. when I just eat these types of foods. And and I took, I don't know, we'll call it eight weeks, and I was like, all right, what, what works with my body and what doesn't? I can see it. I can see what makes me retain water, what creates the bloating, all those those things. And it's it's absolutely what I'm eating and, and, and but paying attention. And to what you're I was eating. just going to say, you, you have to pay attention. You have to pay attention. You have to try things to a healthy level, right? Experiment, including certain foods or, or removing them and just pay attention. Your, your body will tell you, you know, it's, it's incredibly smart. We just, we don't listen to it all the time. Yeah. Um, the one piece of advice you're going to give for, if somebody says this group class thing, I've always been intimidated. I'm scared, whatever. Um, what would be your advice for like taking that first step? Bring a friend, um, bring a friend and just know that every single person in that room was once a brand new. Um, and I think they will, they will understand and resonate with you more than you think, you know what I mean? Everybody remembers what it's like to be a beginner. Um, I think also finding the right gym, the right studios. There's a lot of studios out there not necessarily in Orange County, but just in general that are, can be very clicky or very like all about, you know, the appearance on the outside. Right. And then there are some that foster great community and really, um, focus on, on the good values and the, and the benefits and that are all encompassing, not just what you look like on the outside, you know, for me, it was yoga. It was, um, it's easy for me to go on a run. It's easy for me to go play a game of some sort of CrossFit, um, but yoga was, I knew I need my body needed it. Mm-hmm. I, needed, I knew I needed to start incorporating it, but I was scared. I was scared. scared it's of being terrifying. Shady. Being a beginner at anything is terrifying, right? But it's so good for our brains. Yeah. I had, I had some good friends that started taking me and uh, so the, I don't know if I would have just gone by myself unless I had. Yeah. I always say invited me and bring a buddy, whether yeah. they've done it or not either, but at least you have a little bit of a support system, you know? Yeah. So you gave your nutrition, you gave your, your group. Now you're mm-hmm. as an entrepreneur, mm. specifically a female entrepreneur. If you're talking to my daughter, what's your biggest piece of advice? I would say, listen to your gut. You know, I know that might sound a little bit cliche, but I think, yeah, I think we get so wrapped up in what's going on on the outside in social media, especially these days. Um, there's a lot of noise. And I think truly deep down, um, if you listen to yourself, you'll be able to position yourself in the right situations around the right people to kind of 
get on the path that you're meant to to walk in life yeah um i th- i think on that gut thing it's it's also i'd add or i i, I guess i'd say from personal experience of knowing where you want to go definitely I think we all think like we get lost in we don't think we get lost in the grind and sometimes we forget where we're trying to go and all of a sudden we got to lift up and go like okay is this getting me to where I want to go or do I need to go somewhere else Mm -hmm. definitely all right you get to ask me a question what would your last meal be what would my last meal be Mm -hmm. you can have anything in the world. I don't even know if I'm going to have a meal or I'm going to go straight to the bazooki. Oh, <laughs> we just became best friends. Yeah, I'm probably just going to, so it's actually insane. My mom, <laughs> we do Sunday dinner almost every Sunday at my mom's and she's, she makes bazookis and now all the oh grandkids my God. and all the cousins, um, like love bazookis, which, so it started at like BJ's or yep. whatever, where I used to get them, yep. but a bazooki, I'd, I'd probably just go straight to what that. What flavor would you choose? Well, chocolate chip cookie, like the warm chocolate chip the cookie with vanilla. traditional, with vanilla. Yeah, that's, that's my go-to. I don't think it can get much better than that. I think yeah. that's a great choice. If I'm going to have a meal before that, it's kind of crazy, um, but I've been eating it since like junior high, and I've probably had it more than any other meal, is Wahoo's number two. Oh, wow. Two chicken tacos from Wahoo's, white rice, black beans. Simple. Simple, like I can go eat that. I probably ate it four days a week for lunch. Back I love in the day, it. So. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the time. Yeah, thank you.